know what you're trying to do. I'm trying to free your mind. Behind its peaceful facade, this paradise is a battleground. Rival armies flow across the land, but no chief rules supreme. One will try, daring to link by force a chain of islands that have never been conquered. Sweeping in from the sea, a flotilla spits forth its cargo. In the Pacific, the tide of war rolls on. The year is 1775. 2,000 miles from the nearest continent, the people live in isolation, but not in peace. Even as the island's volcanoes create new land, the islanders fight over the old. Many jewels adorn the chain. Hawaii, the largest. Maui. Lanai. Molokai. Oahu. Kauai. Together with smaller gems, they have risen from the Pacific floor each island and Eden, with abundance enough for all. But Eden had one ruler. Here there are many. Each chief craves power, and each is willing to fight for it. When a chief goes to war, every man leaves his fields or fishing boats and becomes a warrior. But the elite warriors belong to a standing army called the Koa. A warrior from the island of Hawaii is destined to become more famous than any other. He is Kamehameha, the Lonely One. He was born here on the wild and rocky coast of Hawaii in the mid-1700s. Born in the shadow of an ancient temple built 1,500 years before for the war god Ku. Before he reaches his 20th year, Kamehameha will prove himself worthy of his birthplace. As a child, he traveled the same path as other boys. They watched as their elders prepared food. Made feather necklaces and capes and carved images of their gods. Best of all, they would visit the beach and admire the double-hulled canoes. veins, the nobility had its duties. As a young man, he had no choice but to train for the koa, to become an elite warrior. He 
he practiced every day under his teacher Keiku Haupio, learning blows to the chest, jabs to the windpipe, moves that in a second could strike a man dead. Under the master's demanding eye, Kamehameha repeated each movement endlessly. In the battles to come, these were the skills on which his life would depend. By the time he reached the age of 20, Kamehameha stood over six feet tall. He would prove more than a match for most men. As the British explorer George Vancouver later saw for himself. Kamehameha defended himself with the greatest dexterity. In one instance particularly, against six spears that were hurled at him at nearly the same instant. Three, he caught as they were flying with one hand. Two, he broke by parrying them with his spear in the other. And the sixth, by trifling inclination of his body, passed harmless. the koa trained with clubs and daggers carved of hardwoods and knives lined with shark's teeth. Even without weapons, these warriors were deadly, employing bone-crunching maneuvers like the floating jaw, the owl's grab, the flying fish. In his youth, the only battles Kamehameha fought were mock combat. The warrior's only shield was their skill, their only armor, sheer strength. In times of peace, no commoner could come near his chief. Not even the commoner's shadow could fall upon him. But the time of forbidden shadows has been interrupted. The chief needs all the men he can summon. He is about to go to war. King Kalanio Puhu rules the big island of Hawaii. But it isn't big enough. He covets his neighbor, Maui, but has failed to conquer it. In 1775, he tries again. Kalanio Puhu builds a new temple to the gods and seeks the counsel of his priests. Their news is good. The gods will favor the Hawaiians. Messengers race through the island, alerting lesser chiefs to bring their men. Every man is needed. Some come willingly, some out of fear of arrest. Farmers and laborers, they drop their tools and pick up their weapons. The invasion will ride on a fleet of war canoes. Each is double hull, each hull carved from a single tree. The biggest canoes can carry 40 warriors, their weapons and food, and gourds filled with water.
evening before they embark, the priests pray to their gods and look deep into the skies. There they make out the shapes of animals, signs of strength, speed, and ferocity. The omens are good. The time is right. That night, as Kamehameha stands watch over the canoes, he knows that just beyond the waves lies his chance for glory. At dawn, the army commanders of Hawaii assemble. An eyewitness later recorded. There shone the feather capes of the soldiers, woven in the ancient pattern and colored like the hues of the rainbow. With helmets on their heads, whose arc shone like a night in summer when the crescent lies within the moon. The gleaming cloaks and helmets offer less protection than status. These are the highest chiefs and the greatest warriors. <laughs> On Maui, the Hawaiians beach their canoes in silence. Their invasion is a surprise and a success. The Hawaiians head up the coast in search of villages to loot and burn. The king of Maui prepares to retaliate with an ambush. Suddenly from the hills, the men of Maui attack. This weapon is made of fiber, leaves, even human hair. In the hands of a man with a strong arm and a sharp eye, the sling is murderous. Now it's the Hawaiians who are surprised. Yet their priests remind them that the god of war fights on their side. The battle begins with champions from both armies stepping forward to hurl taunts. It is the last moment before blood is shed. Kamehameha fights in a unit of five called a lima, or hand. Each hand fights alongside seven more hands, forming a company of 40. The companies form up. The front line of Hawaiians advances a phalanx of men holding pikes up to 20 feet long. Behind them, men with spears and clubs. The Hawaiians cannot be matched for skill or bravery. 
They are simply outnumbered. As his comrades retreat, Kamehameha fights back, at first with javelins. Kamehameha's skill is unequaled. Around him, the men of Maui fall back. Elsewhere, the Hawaiians are in trouble. No man shows more bravery than Kamehameha. His boyhood teacher has taught him well, so well that one of the many he saves today is his master. But Kamehameha alone cannot win the battle. With night closing in, the Hawaiians take to the safety of their canoes and the sea. For Hawaii, the battle has been a bloody defeat. For Kamehameha, a personal triumph. He earns a nickname, the hard-shelled crab. For in battle, spears and stones seem to bounce off him. Even the men of Maui make note of him. There was one soldier of Hawaii named Kamehameha. He was a brave fellow. Kamehameha has made his name memorable. Before long, he will make it unforgettable. For three years, the struggle between Hawaii and Maui drags on except in the annual season of Makahiki. Then war is banned, and the harvest is gathered under the benevolent eye of the god Lono. Lono's image, wide sheets of pure white tapa cloth draped from a towering pole. In the year 1778, it is not the god Lono who appears before the Hawaiians, but a British captain named James Cook the first white man to reach the islands. Kalani Opu'u, still king of the island of Hawaii, takes several of his warriors out to the ship, among them a young man who has risen to become a high-ranking warrior, Kamehameha. Cook's lieutenant describes the meeting. We soon discovered among the chief's attendants, Kamehameha, as savage a looking face as I ever saw. It, however, by no means seemed an emblem of his disposition, which was good-natured and humorous, though his manner showed somewhat of an overbearing spirit. Undaunted by the newcomers, Kamehameha takes note of their ways and their weapons. Immediately, he begins to barter for them. When a boat is stolen rather than traded, the squabble blows up into a battle. The English sail away, leaving behind Cook's body and a legacy of murderous weapons. More traders follow, more weapons are traded. Above all others, Kamehameha understood the power and potential of the spears that belch fire. In 1782, Kamehameha is named the new guardian of the war god Ku, recognition that he is the finest warrior on the island. Within a decade, the old chief is dead, and Kamehameha has overcome all opponents to become chief of the island of Hawaii. Other chiefs rule an island or two. Kamehameha thirsts to rule them all. Now he has the power and the weapons to try. He builds a huge fleet of war canoes, 
1,000 in all, some mounted with guns. 15 years after the Hawaiians' defeat on Maui, Kamehameha returns. This time, there is no retreat, only revenge. Other islands fall. Five years after Kamehameha's campaign begins, the omens are right for invading the key island Oahu. This time, the king of Hawaii will rely on more than omens. Kamehameha mobilizes the largest force ever seen in the islands. Flanked by 12,000 warriors, Kamehameha himself leads the attack. Wielding muskets and spears, his army pushes the soldiers of Oahu back. Back to the edge of a thousand foot cliff. The Hawaiians show no mercy. Those who don't jump are pushed. Oahu surrenders. Only Kauai remains. It too would fall. Messengers carry word throughout the islands. Ended is the war. Decades of bloodshed are over. The triumphant Hawaiians give their name to the chain of islands. They are simply known as Hawaii. Kamehameha, the merciless soldier and conquering chief, now becomes a benevolent king. In 1793, Captain George Vancouver once more met the man he had known as an angry young warrior 15 years earlier. I was agreeably surprised in finding that his riper years had softened that stern ferocity which his younger years had exhibited. Vancouver belonged to the first wave of a flood of traders and settlers. This Pacific jewel could not hope to remain unplundered. A century later, Hawaii lost its monarch and its freedom and became an outpost of a greater empire, America. The Hawaiians, once unequaled in battle, unrivaled in leadership, could only look back to when a young warrior known as the hard-shelled crab was their king. And they were the warriors of paradise.